So uh, welcome everyone to lecture number 19. Uh, what we do today, we are continuing our discussion on the extension regimes. I started this last time. I started discussing about continental rifting or extension tectonics. And um, what we are going to do today, we are going to go and travel around the world and uh, look uh, in more detail at some examples of continental rifts. As you can see them listed, uh, we are going to go to the Rhine Grub and the Baikal Rift, East African Rift System with the Afar Depression, and then finally to the Basin and Range province. Um, and uh, we'll have this uh, example of a transition from a rift to ocean basin, which is the Red Sea. So le uh, let me just uh, start this. Um, if you remember uh, last time, we uh, were showing this map and uh, I was pointing out to you uh, the blue, uh, these blue uh, zones in blue, uh, they are the rifts that you are going uh, to discuss today. Um, last time we discussed more or less the uh, theory behind rifting, uh, but today we are going to have a look, uh, geologically speaking, at, uh, at these uh, interesting uh, locations um, on the planet. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you will enjoy this. Um, we have two, uh, two styles of uh, crustal extension, uh, and we are talking here about continental crustal extension. This is actually what's really interesting. Um, we have the, the classical style, narrow, uh, narrow zones of uh, extension, and these are what we call the rifts and the gravels. Um, and uh, here are the uh, examples of the uh, Rhine graben the uh, Lake Baikal, um, the East African Rift. Um, now, what happens if the rifting is persisting uh, and uh, continuous at some point, the continent would be split apart. Many of these rifts don't get to that stage, but in some cases in the geologic history, this happens. And uh, of course, we discussed about the supercontinent cycle. So at some point, a continent would have to be split apart. Um, and then uh, we have another style, and this is represented by the Basin and Range province in the US. It's a very uh, famous, but also, for instance, in Europe, the Pannonian Basin um, would be the zones uh, which would be broad, that suffer extension, but they are broad zones of deformation. So it's not only one uh, valley, or uh, you'll see in the case of the African Rift, uh, two valleys. Uh, it's not this. We have an area which suffers extension, and then you have this uh, topography created by the um, by the horse, yeah, elevated blocks and valleys, the gravels, and you also have in these areas metamorphic domes or core complexes that we discussed. Um, well. Let's, uh, what happens in, in this case, uh, it is continental extension, but we don't get to the stage of new oceanic crust. It's more diffuse. Um, all right, let's start with the upper Rhine gravel. So now we travel to Western Europe and the upper Rhine gravel, you see it here in the middle of this uh, physiographic map. Uh, this is the upper Rhine gravel. So uh, probably it extends from uh, Basel here in, uh, Switzerland at the border with uh, uh, with uh, Germany and with France, and it goes up to uh, Frankfurt in Germany, more or less. Um, and as you can see, it's part of a system. So this is called the Upper Rhine Graben, uh, the segment that you see in the middle. Uh, to the northwest, you see something that is called the Lower Rhine Embayment. So it is a zone that under use extension. Um, and um, as you can see, we have a change in the direction. Uh, they are called Rhine because along the valley flows the Rhine. Rhine River is one of the two major rivers of uh, Europe, the largest ones, the Rhine and the Danube. But the Rhine goes uh, towards northwestern Europe and flows into the North Sea. The Danube uh, flows all the way to uh, southeastern Europe and flows into the Black Sea. Um, so what happens if we were to uh, focus first on this part of this rift system? Uh, you have basically, uh, uh, we have a valley here, yeah? which is bordered by uh, uh, steep folds, uh, 
uh, you see the the angles of these faults uh, is between 55 and 85 uh, degrees, uh, with the majority somewhere around 60. Um, and uh, here, the width of the of the rift uh, is approximately uh, 35 kilometers, and the crustal extension that was suffered approximately five kilometers. The crust suffered thinning here. You see uh, 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 the maximum thinning that it suffered was by uh, six to seven kilometers, so that there are zones uh, in the southern part of the gravel that crust is only 24 kilometers thick. Um, <clears throat> now, what happens is um, there was a bulge. Yeah, we, we discussed about this bulging in the sense of rifting uh, in this area so of uh, active rifting. And um, the bulge was uh, leading to shoulders of the gravel on both sides. Um, and that's why in the southern part here, if you look here, you have two uh, mountain ranges. One is the Vosges uh, and uh, to the west, and on the other side is the Black Forest. Yeah. So here, um, and these shoulders will 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 see what the paleo surface would have been today if it, if it were not for the erosion. All right. So uh, in this, uh, what you have to see in this map there are two elements, and I'll explain uh, to you. The green lines. So they are ISO lines, and basically the green lines uh, indicate um, the thickness of the crust. So you see where the crust is thinnest. So, uh, so you see that here in the southern part, in the central part of the of the rift, we have the thinnest crust. You see, 24 kilometers only. And as you go away from the rift, you see, uh, as you go away, the the crust starts to uh, get back to normal. Towards more than 30 kilometers. Um, <clears throat> now, if we were to 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 uh, consider now these colors, what they represent? Uh, the rifting started in Eocene, so you see, uh, about 45 uh, million years ago. So imagine if we had the surface that pre-existing surface in Eocene when the rifting started. On the shoulders, that surface would be elevated today, uh, but there was erosion. Yeah. So what happens if we were to consider the initial surface? This is what's shown in blue. So this blue would say today, if that surface were to be preserved, we would be at more than 2,500 meters above the sea level. And also the part of that surface that's dropped down into the rift, as you can see, it's more than 3,000 meters in, in this part of the the gravel. So this, I, I think, it's something that it's quite spectacular. Of course, uh, the the part that went down is uh, covered by the sediments, you know, by sedimentary infill, and the part that went up, part of it was eroded. So this is not today's topography that we see, but still, uh, the, this um, model shows you what happened. Yeah, the amount of uh, vertical <laughs> uh, uh, change. Uh, the valley floor, the, the rift floor relative to the shoulders. All right. So I think this is very interesting uh, for you to consider. All right. So, um, so teacher, may I ask yes. you a question? Of course. Yes, God. Yeah, we are. Uh, this is something simple. Uh, I want to know if there are some examples of gradients uh, 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 in little scales, not properly micro. But uh, you know, medium. For example, for us to 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 see an example here in Colombia, or because I think this is very very large. So maybe yeah, maybe like a we different cannot... scale of uh, rifting, yes. like at crustal scale. I mean, it's not that easy, yeah, because we are talking about something that affects the whole crust. So um, <clears throat> what happens in the Andes? Uh, we uh, might see or gene collapse in some areas, but not really this type of rifts. Yeah, these are very special examples. So, so I, I'm not sure where we could uh, in Colombia for this. Uh, I don't know if there is any. Of course, nothing at this scale. Uh, and in that, Colombia, uh, not because we are uh, at we are near to, to 
a limit converted margin. Yeah. So maybe yes. not. But for example, uh, at medium scale, you know, something one person could see this is this is a rift. Yeah, well, I I have to think about this. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer right now. Um, not at this scale, definitely. Uh, obviously, there is a, the large part of the uh, cratons of the South American right. continent, uh, which in their uh, long Precambrian uh, evolution uh, may definitely have suffered this. So there might be hidden uh, such rifts, but uh, not on the scale of uh, of these ones, obviously, we have the rifted margins, which are all the eastern margins of the uh, of the continent. Um, but I'll think. Let, let me just search if there's anything that you could see where you could see this type of um, phenomena with uh, the normal faulting and down dropped basins and so on. Uh, I'm not re really aware of something which would be within the reach here, let's say in the region. Uh, but that doesn't mean that. At a, at a, as you said, at a, at a different scale would not exist. We have grabbins all, all over the place, like small ones uh, for different reasons. Uh, it's just that I'm not that uh, familiar in detail yet with the, you know, all the uh, geology of this part of the world uh, in detail, as I said. Um, but I'll, I'll look it up, Gabriel. I don't have an answer right now for you. Thank if you. That's... <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, so. Um, all right, so I'll, uh, I, I will look it up. Okay, so what I was going to show you is this uh, 3D block diagram. Um, so what you see, um, you see the Earth's uh, mantle, yeah, the, the basically having this bulging, yeah, obviously. You see the uh, moho, yeah, you see the moho uh, showing the bulge. Uh, this is from seismic data, from gravity data, gravity data as well, um, can indicate that. Um, and obviously, we'd have partial melting uh, due to this rise. So we have volcanism. We have volcanism that is uh, related to this uh, process of rifting. And this is a very famous uh, volcano, uh, Kaiserstuhl in Germany. Um, so, this gives you an idea. So the Vosges are on the left um, in France and uh, the Black Forest in Germany here on the right. All right, so um, let's see what I was going to show you. This is very interesting. So we go from the south, uh, south, southwest, uh, to the north, northeast. So we go along the, uh, the rift axis and we have this section, yeah, along the axis, not perpendicular to the axis. So what you have to see here, because you may have studied already stratigraphy, and this is another thing that we are developing in our um, uh, geological understanding. If you look at these uh, sedimentary layers, this is the rift infill, you can see that the rifting started, the, so the oldest, uh, the oldest sedimentary layer, uh, you see it more developed here. So obviously it started in the south, the rifting, and you see in the sense that you get newer layers uh, towards the north, you see that the rifting proceeded from the south and then towards the north. Yeah? So that's the idea. At the time, uh, the sedimentation of this base layer started at that time in this northern part uh, below Mannheim and to the north of, of Mannheim, uh, there was no rifting yet at that time. So I think this is interesting in understanding uh, the evolution of rifting in time. Um, and uh, here, another very spectacular thing I want you to see. You remember that we discussed about the transform faults, which are not actual um, uh, faults that at some point there was faulting that shifted various segments where you have um, movement. Uh, uh, it's that these faults were developed along with the segments where you have um, extension or compression. Um, and do we have here a system which kinematically replaces what would be a transform fault in the ocean? Uh, so you see, this is the upper Rhine graben, the one that we discussed about uh, in Germany. And this is the Bresseron graben. Yeah? 
uh, you see it going uh, towards the Mediterranean in the south. It is not that these two caravans or rifts were initially an initial rift, linear rift, and they were shifted. They developed there uh, along with this complex system of faults that uh, acts kinematically as a transform fault. So you see the movement of extension, as you can see this left uh, side moving towards the left, uh, towards the west, basically is transferred along this, accommodated along this system of faults so that it, uh, this part of the crust, and also with the uh, west side of the uh, breast graben, they move together. So kinematically, it makes sense, yeah? So I think this is very interesting in terms of, um, of seeing uh, this, uh, this uh, kinematic agreement, if you want. All right, so one more thing about the, um, uh, this uh, rift system. What you see here, uh, you see the current, uh, you see the current uh, stress field. Yeah. So as you can see, the the um, the the current stress field, as you can see, uh, basically the the present day stress field, you see it here in what's called late tertiary. Yeah, late tertiary. So this field, uh, this present day field, doesn't um, facilitate the extension in the upper Rhine graben. Obviously, as you can see, the extension has this direction of northeast to southwest. So obviously this facilitated the development of what's called the lower Rhine embayment. Yeah, as you can see, but the lower Rhine embayment is obviously a passive uh, zone of rifting. We don't have a mantle bulge. Yeah, we don't have uh, graben shoulders. So we have this, uh, uh, this uh, structure that uh, has been developing because of the uh, uh, current stress system. Now, you see what happened in um, early tertiary in Eocene. What happened was that the stress field was different. And obviously the extension, you see, was perpendicular to the upper Rhine uh, rift. Yeah, so, so that's what happened. So you can see that there was a rotation of the stress field. Yeah. And of, of course, in, in geologic time, we have changes in the stress field in the continents. These are far field stresses that travel through the uh, continental lithosphere uh, that respond to the stresses at the plate boundaries, all right? So I think this is also something very interesting uh, for you to, to see uh, this. All right, and one more thing about the uh, upper Rhine graben is just text, but here, uh, what I want to, to mention is here we have in the uh, upper Rhine graben, we have a high heat flow. So you can imagine the bulging, yeah, the bulging of the, of the mantle. So you see in the, uh, below the uh, axis of the rift, uh, the upper boundary of the mantle is about 200 degrees Celsius, uh, has a temperature uh, 200 degrees Celsius higher than on the sides. And what happens is this leads to a high heat flow, a high heat flow. So imagine a normal geothermal gradient is let's say you drill uh, and let's say uh, at one kilometer depth in an area, in a continental area with a normal uh, heat flow, uh, at one kilometer depth, the temperature would be about 30 degrees. Now think about this. You drill there in the rift valley in the Rhine graben, and at one kilometer depth, you have uh, localities with 80 degrees. That's a lot. Yeah, that's why when you think about it in the Canadian Shield or in the um, Kapwald crater that's in South Africa, we have these deepest mines, you know, which are these deep gold mines going down to three kilometers, uh, and the miners can still survive there. Of course, it is very hot, but it's a very, the shield areas, which are old, yeah, and, and uh, old and uh, uh, thick uh, continental lithosphere have a low heat flow. So that's why maybe at the bottom of three kilometers, they would have maybe 
50 degrees. Of course, they have ventilators and all these things, but the conditions are difficult for the miners. Um, anyway, just to give you an idea. So what happens? We have high heat flow in the upper Rhine graph. So you can imagine that, uh, that um, you have water, let's say you have uh, cold water from the surface infiltrating along faults. It is heated and then rises to the surface. And we have uh, thermal springs. Yeah? So th there is in Germany a very famous uh, resort, uh, resort uh, town called Baden-Baden. It has casinos since the 19th century. All the European aristocracy was going there to, to play at the casino and so on. But the reason they were going and they developed this very famous resort is because of these thermal springs yeah, being in their uh, upper Rhine Valley. All right, so I think uh, this is interesting for you to consider. Let's go to another part of the world. Again, very interesting. And we go to the Baikal Rift. Now, the Baikal Rift, and you, uh, you can see on top of the Baikal Rift, you have the Baikal Lake. Uh, the Baikal Lake is um, basically the largest freshwater lake uh, on the planet. Um, it is also the deepest, 1,600 meters deep, being developed on a rift. Uh, also, the Lake Superior in North America, for instance, being developed on a Proterozoic Age rift. It is a deep lake as well. But this one has a lot more water. It's a lot more deeper, yeah? uh, and also probably the oldest. So I think this inspires you to maybe go there and see it. <laughs> uh, this one, not not really uh, the bike, um, because we still. If uh, that's why I'm I'm showing David uh, this. Uh, uh, this is a relatively new geologically speaking, the rift. Uh, as you can see, we have a very complex uh, system here, kinematically speaking. You can imagine the uh, basically indenter tectonics of the Indian subcontinent hitting the Asian landmass, hitting it and creating the Himalayas and the formation of the Tibetan plateau. And as you can see, the Baikal, you see the Baikal uh, lake here and the rift system, is more or less at a uh, at, at such an angle, uh, not really totally perpendicular, but also it's a high angle um, uh, relative to the to the um, uh, compression that comes and is transmitted from the uh, uh, collision zone, the Himalayan co collision zone. So you can imagine that the stress field actually opened. Yeah, it, it, we had this opening of the rift. Now, there is another interesting thing, and I'm gonna show you where this rift is localized, yeah, geologically speaking. So if you look here, uh, we have uh, basically a zone, a, a, a geologic contact, major contact, between a very old lithosphere, which is a Siberian craton. And this is what's called sand bicycle fold belt, so more recent. Uh, trains. And what happens here, so at this contact, you have a zone of weakness. And at this zone of weakness, the, there was a response to this remote stress field that opened the rift. And you can see this very nicely. Um, now, you can see uh, with this, where you have uh, volcanics, where you have uh, sedimentary rocks, of course, here you have the water and so on. Um, Let's look uh, here. If you look at the basins in the um, in the Baikal Lake, uh, you have some um, seismic uh, survey here that was done, and you can see as a radiography, and you see the rift valley very nicely. You see it imaged here, yeah, and an interpretation of it based on this seismic image, uh, and you see the sediments. The sediments have. Uh, uh, thicknesses of about seven kilometers, that's a lot. And put on top of it one kilometer of water. So we have basically the, the rift floor the, uh, uh, on which the sediments were deposited. We have it at eight to nine kilometers. That's a lot. I mean, it's quite impressive when you look at this trough and uh, when you think it's so narrow and so deep, it is really impressive. 
Um, and here is what I was trying to, to show. Now at a different scale, you see here the Siberian Craton lithosphere, yeah, as opposed to the fold belt here, more recent. And you see the, the, uh, the rift is localized at this zone of contact of these different, uh, different uh, parts of the lithosphere. So, and also another thing to, to consider is the asymmetry. So basically it's a Wernicke or <laughs> Wernicke uh, model, a simple shear model of rifting along a, a major fold, if you want, which leads to asymmetric rifts. Yeah? So in terms of the, of the uh, thickness of the crust, you see uh, the Siberian um, Craton 38 to 44 yeah, uh, here. And the cyan Baikal fold belt, it's a fold belt. So it's a zone of um, thickening, uh, orogenic thickening. It's 43 to 50 kilometers. Whereas the rift, yeah, the, uh, the uh, rift axis, it's only 35 kilometers. So obviously we have thinning there. So I think this is very interesting. Um, obviously you see that the rifting tends to happen at zones, if you know, if we have pre-existing zones of weakness, yeah, uh, like uh, the contact zone between major uh, different terrains, that's what happens. And this is what explains, for instance, we go now to Africa, and you 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 might wonder why the rift valleys developed where they developed. They developed on pre-existing fault lines in the basement, yeah. Those are the zones of weakness, and the zone of weakness is, is exploited, and it it yields to the stresses. Yeah, that's the idea. So let's travel now to Africa, and here we have something really, really interesting. We have a, a triple junction here, but this is not a triple junction in the sea between three mid-ocean ridges. We actually have uh, mid-ocean ridges if you want, in the Red Sea, which is a very young uh, oceanic basin in the Gulf of Aden, a bit more advanced. And then here on the continent, yeah, going from um, uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia down to uh, Kenya and uh, Tanzania. So here, if you look at the geologic map, you see uh, all these Cenozoic volcanic rocks, yeah, the volcanic rocks, uh, which basically reflect the volcanism associated with rifting uh, in the eastern part of the African continent. And um, here, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you exactly what the rift. So this, geographically speaking, this part of the African rift system is called the Afar Depression. Maybe you have heard about it. It's very hot there, 50 degrees the surface. So very hot, very dry, terrible conditions. Um, as we go to the south, uh, there are these two branches. Um, it's the East African Rift or the Kenya or Gregory Rift. And then it's a Central African Rift, as you can see. Yeah, so, so these two branches uh, of the rift system. And as I was mentioning, these uh, rifts exploit pre-existing, yeah, they are parallel to structures in the old Precambrian basement. And that's where the, basically the lithosphere held it. Um, so it's a relatively young, uh, young uh, tertiary, you see uh, rift again. Um, <clears throat> and vertical displacement along graben faults can be as much as four kilometers. Very impressive, actually, very impressive. Now, you may wonder, how, you know, how much time we have to wait until we see the split of the African continent? <laughs> well, we may never see it. I mean, even if we were to, to be, uh, you know, to have uh, infinite lives, we may never see it. Like nowadays, we have uh, rates of spreading of 0 0.4 to 1 millimeters per year, which is one order of magnitude less than at uh, plate boundaries like in the Red Sea or Gulf of Aden. And what happens in, uh, with these triple junctions is that typically in the triple junctions, you would have 
uh, one of the branches that dies out in time. Yeah, it doesn't develop um, uh, basically in the end. So this might be the case with Africa. Now you will see on the internet a future, uh, you know, by uh, imagination of some geologists, future ideas of what the, the split Africa would look like. But geologically speaking, this may not happen in the end. Um, so that's why I, I wrote here that the activity is waning. Waning means kind of is slowing down and disappearing, yeah? Uh, limited seismic activity and so on. So it will be in the end an aulacogen, which is a term we use for the uh, rifts that at some point die out and don't get to full development. Um, Teacher, yes, may I ask you yes, a question? David, sure. Uh, so you're telling us that is really, really slow, but this can uh, be like a, a danger or a, or cause problems to the people living in the area, like a tectonic danger for something else, or is it too little to take into account for something no, for right certain now, places or a, houses? Yeah, right now, I mean, it's limited seismic activity. Of course, if you happen to be in an area where you have a seismic, it could be a, a little of a geologic hazard. And you have at some parts, yeah, you have, uh, if you see images from Kenya and so on, you might see development of cracks in the ground and so on. So, um, so locally, we might have some activity. Uh, so, but it's not overall uh, that dramatic, yeah, like in uh, our parts. But still, I mean, still we have volcanism. So I would say volcanism, maybe you haven't seen in, um, in Eastern Congo, sometimes you have these images on TV of uh, lava coming into towns and things like this. So you have still, it's a dynamic zone where you have manifestations, but geologically speaking, over a longer period of time, it's not going to be that, uh, I, I think the thinking is now, is that at some point it is going to, uh, to vanish, yeah, the activity. But as I said, volcanism is a problem, yeah, in some areas. You're welcome, David. So here is an example, uh, again, a block diagram showing you, if we had a, a cross section, uh, showing you the thickening, uh, the thinning, sorry, the thinning of both the crust and the uh, lithosphere, yeah, uh, with a mantle plume. Uh, you see the two branches here, uh, the uh, Eastern branch or Kenya or Gregory Rift and the Central African Graben. Um, and here, although you haven't studied yet um, geophysics, but here you see uh, something that shows you the gravity, uh, what's called the Bouguer gravity anomaly. And what this tries to show, you see this uh, anti-symmetry here. It tries to show that basically the, the lower density of this mantle plume, uh, laterally speaking, we have a, uh, as you, let's say, if you were to come here, you'd see higher density, lower density, higher density. So basically the gravity would show you, yeah, uh, this, these lows would reflect the zones of lower density at depth. Yeah, So it's what we call a negative gravity anomaly reflecting this, all right? So um, that's what we see. Now, let's, uh, this is a satellite image. Uh, I think you will read the text because it's interesting what it tries to say of the uh, satellite image of the Rift Valley, the Eastern uh, branch, Rift Valley uh, floor. And what you can see, you see the, the normal folds, uh, which are uh, parallel. So the North is here, the South is here. It's an oblique image here. You see another fold system, uh, less well-developed, which is, cross-cutting this, um, this uh, system of normal folds on, on the valley floor. Here, uh, what this text will explain that you, you, you see basically a zone, uh, with, which is a lake with uh, uh, red color because it has some algae and some deeper lake. Uh, also, this is called the La Lake Magadi. Um, and also what tries to show you uh, this image is, if you can see here, you have a volcano. Yeah, this is a cone of a volcano and you see it on top of the uh, valley floor uh, folds. So you see the folds are going underneath it. So 
this what this shows is that the volcano is younger yeah younger than the faults so this is very nice work of geological understanding also what the text says is that you see it, the indentations in the the ero uh, erosional features um, in the uh, cone of the volcano which shows us that it wasn't active for a while so we we have this topography of the cone yeah so you can read this it's quite entertaining to to basically have an example of how to interpret such an image geologically speaking all right what i want to to show you is the basically the northern part of the uh, this uh, rift system which is the afar depression where i was saying it's very hot yeah very dry very hot uh, in this part of the world and you see it is triangular and it makes a connection you see this is where we have the triple junction we have the connection here between the red sea the gulf of aden obviously here we have um seafloor spreading in the red sea and in the gulf of aden but the question is this is like a laboratory that's where we see how new oceanic crust might start to be formed yeah and split continental crust yeah it's this transition from oceanic basin to uh, a continental gra uh, or rift so there are some uh, zones with um, low uh, crustal thickness and what is believed little little slivers yeah or narrow stripes of almost oceanic crust as if as if the continental crust was completely uh, split apart now i'm going to show you this in a cross section you see cross section here uh, in this area so if you look here when they talk about narrow stripes they talk about these green lines that you'd see yeah these green lines where they say basaltic dikes and volcanic rocks and that's why they say quasi almost like oceanic crust yeah so it's not completely split but it's just the initiation of the process here so uh, that's a very good laboratory for seeing these processes all right so um what else should i say here uh i will end by showing you what the um, landscape looks like um in this afar uh, region in ethiopia very harsh environment for life as you can see it's basically barren of ve vegetation uh, cannot really sustain life it's a very harsh uh, region but very interesting geologically yeah so you can see actual the fractures yeah uh, yes <laughs> yes david terrifying if you are dropped there and left to walk in 50 degrees celsius yes it is terrifying but if you go prepared with a crew and with a helicopter, probably it's better. <laughs> yeah, to investigate these um, these uh, fractures. All right, now let's look at this connection. Yeah, you can see the Red Sea. The Red Sea is our very young ocean developed. You can see the oceanic crust is uh, basically uh, this zone where we have oceanic crust up to 100 kilometers now this is very little yeah. so we really are seeing a new ocean being formed I, I think this is very very interesting and you can see the the basically uh, the rates of uh, divergence and you can see the largest rates in the southern part and the lowest in the northern part so obviously uh, it's more incipient in the northern part um, it's a more uh, more advanced stage of ocean basin formation in the Gulf of Aden, and you see larger uh, uh, rate of divergence. And here, another interesting thing, when I will uh, talk to you about the strike slip regime, I'll show you some examples. And here, you kind of think what happens, what happens at the end here with this new mid-ocean ridge, where is this movement going? Kinematically speaking, it has to make sense. So obviously we have a very uh, important, <laughs> a very important uh, transform fault here, which is uh, the Jordan Graben. Yeah, so it goes through the Dead Sea at the boundary between uh, Israel and Jordania. 
So a very interesting region, uh, tectonically speaking, and this may uh, makes a connection with the um, with the uh, tectonic elements to the north in the Anatolian plate in Turkey. So very very interesting what's happening here. All right, so this was another example of uh, really really uh, important aspects where we can understand what's happening uh, on our planet presently. What happened in the very deep past, it's a different matter, and we'll discuss this a bit later in the course. Now, uh, you can see here the, the block diagram, you see uh, what would be a cross section through the Red Sea. Uh, see the, here is where we have developed uh, oceanic uh, lithosphere here, you see these greenish areas. The rest would be now passive margins. So these are passive margins. Now the oceanic, uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, yeah, uh, also has passive margins, yeah, but it's an older ocean. Um, and this is a connection with the uh, far depression and here is still continental difference. Uh, which gra uh, graben, um, which graben, uh, because the difference Gabriel here is that here in the Red Sea, we already have oceanic crust and oceanic lithosphere. So the process of seafloor spreading has started. Whereas, yeah, so uh, the central one, what I am just saying there, we have already, we have a true oceanic basin, but at the very beginning, because we already have oceanic crust yeah, and oceanic lithosphere, Re a very narrow stripe. Whereas as we go into the African continent, we have only continental lithosphere that has suffered localized extension, but has not split apart to, to, to uh, lead to the formation of oceanic crust and lithosphere, yeah? So that's the difference. We, you know, we have, um... no, well, it is a zone of divergence, but it is not, you are right, it is not a plate boundary in the uh, East uh, African um, rift. Yeah, so Gabriel's question is if the uh, East, like for example, the East African rift, the Baikal rift, the Rhine graben, yeah, they are not plate boundaries. They are zones of localized extension. No, there is no window to the, you say to the mantle, uh, yeah, no window to the um, very close to the mantle. No, not yet. And uh, as I said, normally, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so all these uh, examples that I was showing you, except for the Red Sea, are zones where we have extension. So uh, divergence, if you want, but divergence in terms of extension of the continental lithosphere but without creating a plate boundary yeah we have without having a plate boundary some of this would evolve would or could evolve into a plate boundary depending on you know what drives the extension and if it's persistent but most of this that i was showing will not yeah that's the idea um <clears throat> all right now the final installment in today's presentation, if you want. Uh, we move uh, on a different continent. So we've been in Europe, we've been in Asia. Uh, now we are going uh, to um, the United States. Now, as I was saying, that doesn't mean that in South America, in the geologic past, and especially in the Precambrian past, we didn't have zones of rifting. It's just that those zones would be hidden by other things now. So we are not recognizing them as examples where you can see real structures. So you might be able to image them, for instance, in the Rio de la Plata Craton, for instance, definitely we have, and we have such branches, definitely we have such branches when uh, South America and Africa split. There were branches like the East African system uh, today that extend into the South American Cratons, they do. But Gabriel's question initially was if we have handy something that where we can go and see easily the, the structures. And nowadays for, you know, the territory that we can, 
walk around and so on here around in Colombia and so on. I don't know at a certain scale these structures in detail, but I'll look it up if there is anything where you can see something at a different scale uh, similar. All right, so um, let's go to the Western United States. Now, some of you may have visited the United States uh, or uh, our, our uh, Part of you will be visiting the United States. Now, personally, if I go to the United States, I like more the Western part of the United States because geologically speaking, it's way more interesting. You can see all these <laughs> phenomena. It's more arid, so you can see the geology. So it is great geology in, in the Western part of the United States because we can see it because of the lack of vegetation. Yeah? So that's the reason that we often give it as an example. But for good reason, we have some very, very interesting phenomena as well. So as you can see in the Western United States, you see something that is called the Great Basin and then the Basin and Range Province. And as you can see, we go from Oregon here to beating California, yeah? uh, you, we go in Arizona, and then we continue into uh, Mexico a bit. And here, and in Utah as well, here we have the Colorado Plateau as well. And then uh, the range here is called the Rocky Mountains. If you go to Colorado, if you go to Denver in Colorado, yeah, uh, you go to Denver and the airport is on the prairie side here. It's like in Bogota in the Sabana. It's the same there in, in Denver. You land uh, on the prairie side and you see like a wall, you see the Rocky Mountains. yeah. Uh, and behind them is a Colorado Plateau, and beyond them is a Basin and Range Province. Now, this Basin and Range Province is an area that prior to its existence as this geologic province was the location of a great mountain range, the Sevier mountain range that has suffered extension. But this is not an extension that was localized in one valley or two valleys in, in the African Reef system. It is more diffuse. So you see it's a wide region that has suffered this extension. And you have this, as you can see, topographically, you have these uh, ranges, yeah, which would be forests, if you want, ranges, and basins in between the ranges. So if you look at this photograph, which is not very good, but you get the idea, yeah, because it's taken from high enough that you can see the ranges, yeah, and in between you have the basins. Now the basins have basin fields, yeah. So the bottom of the of the floor of these basins is deeper than what you see, uh, but still you have this topography, and I'll show you uh, the examples of the topography. Uh, anyway, so if you go to Western United States and you have the chance, go and visit because it's really interesting to to see, yeah, it, geologically speaking. It's like a laboratory. Um, so you remember that last time uh, I was saying that in addition to high angle normal faults, yeah, that we create gravens and forests, here is where people realize that we have these low angle uh, detachment faults, yeah, that form these metamorphic core complexes. So you've seen this slide last time, but this is a region where you typically have also this, uh, these features, yeah, geologically speaking. And uh, just to give you an idea, let's look a bit at the topography here. So we take this area here, and you can see very nicely the ranges and the basins in between, yeah? So the extension was east-west direction, uh, and it's across, 600 kilometers. So this is huge. Yeah, this is a huge zone that suffered uh, extension. And, and as you can see, there is a progression. It started in the south, in southern Arizona, and moved the uh, extension process towards uh, Oregon through Nevada. Yeah. So that's the idea. Now, if you read the text here, just to give you an idea, well, Snake Range. You see here the Snake Range um, at the um, the uh, Utah uh, Nevada border here in the south. You see the Snake Range, and it says basically uh, we talk about a range which is four 
thousand meters high. Yeah. And the basin floor, it's down to uh, 1700 uh, meters. So you, we have a relief of 2300 meters. Yeah. So again, we have significant relief. So you can, you can imagine this uh, vertical uh, displacement if you want. So you see, uh, this is explained in different parts of this region what this vertical displacement is today. Right? So, and finally, geologically speaking, if you were to look at this, and I was going to show you this in terms of geology, this would be a geologic map. So obviously what you see here, this is the snake range here. It's here, yeah? Um, so you can make a correlation between these two images if you want. But what you see basically, the ranges, yeah, these this peaks, you see they are Paleozoic sedimentary rocks, most of them, yeah? And in between, in white, they are quaternary sediments. So in between these ranges where the floor dropped, we have sedimentary infill, yeah? And obviously we have some uh, magmatism here. So that's why you have volcanic rocks and intrusions as well, yeah? So think about crustal thickness now. Nowadays, it's a zone of thinner crust, about 30 kilometers thin. Um, the Colorado Plateau to the east here, to the east, it's about 50 kilometers thin, yeah? Uh, now, think about this. Before this extension, uh, this collapse, this was a mountain range. This was a severe mountain range, which was thicker, yeah, because it was an origin, was thicker than the Colorado Plateau. And basically it suffered this collapse and the zone suffered extension. Yeah? So I think this is another example, a very famous world-class example of uh, extension. Now, I think that because extension is more counterintuitive because you can think well we or we have origins we have compression we have this that's why i wanted to spend some time with you to discuss both the theory and and some great examples because i think any geoscientist should be aware of these uh, great examples um, that we have on planet all right so this is it for today i hope you enjoyed it uh, if you have more questions, please ask me. <laughs> don't be shy. If I know, I answer them. If I don't, I don't. Um, so uh, if not, I'll see you on Thursday. Have a great afternoon today. Um, and we'll continue with uh, uh, convergence, yeah? Thank you, teacher. You are welcome. You are welcome, uh, all of you.